Good morning. Please open your Bibles if you have them to Ephesians chapter 3. You'll find the notes for this morning's message in the bulletin and on the back side of the notes, the text, if you don't have a Bible. I'd like to begin this morning by reading Ephesians chapter 3 in its entirety, even though we'll only be looking at the first part of the first half. Um, It's such a cohesive unit, I think it'd be helpful to read the entire chapter. Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery was that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, we pray that you would give us that power by your Spirit to our inner being, that we might comprehend more fully the grace, the love, the power at work towards us in Christ Jesus. Lord, as we review realities and truths that I'm sure in one sense are not new to us, help us to grasp the significance, the importance. The Apostle Paul is convinced that apart from your power and your spirit, we will not properly understand these things. So guard us from a superficial understanding. And help us to behold your power at work, your goodness, your love in Christ for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to begin by way of review. Hopefully by the time we finish Ephesians, you'll know it pretty well inside and out. Structurally, if you'll remember, it's divided in half. The first three chapters primarily covering doctrine, and the the last three chapters covering duty or application. The Apostle Paul lays out truth in the first three chapters, and he applies truth in the latter three chapters. We're, we're nearing, we're beginning chapter three now. And so as you look at the first three chapters, they divide each chapter separately. The first chapter composed, if you look at it, chapter one, after a brief introduction, verses three through 14 are a, a long blessing of God. And, and Paul is praising God for what he's done on behalf of the Ephesians, But there's a sense in which Paul assumes they know this, or they know some of this already. But then, after that benediction, as he focuses on the Trinitarian's God at his work in saving them, he moves to a pastoral prayer. He's praying and thanking God on their behalf in their hearing. He's thankful for their love for the saints. He's thankful for their faith. And his prayer for them, don't miss this, is that God would, by his Spirit, give them power to understand things. You see that in verse 17, that the 
God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know, and then three things, what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. So chapter 1 ends with this prayer for God's enabling by his spirit to understand, to know divine realities. And he particularly wants to understand the power that's at work in them. And then chapter 2 contains two grand contrasts, two before and afters. First, individual and vertical, dealing with our deadness before God and, and our reconciliation to him. And then the second before and after, the second great contrast, is a corporate problem. As Gentiles, what has God done to bring us in, we who are far away? And we spent the last seven weeks going through chapter 2. Well, now, in chapter 3, Paul begins by applying this. He starts with, for this reason. And he's, I think, building upon everything he said before and setting up for what comes ahead. And he's going to introduce now, in clarity, in greater clarity, a mystery. You see the word appears three times in our text this morning in the ESV in verse 3, how the mystery is made known. Verse 4, insight into the mystery. Verse 6, this mystery And again, in verse 9, he mentions it. What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God? And we're going to look this morning at the mystery of Christ revealed. Um, Paul has some critical information for the Ephesian church and for us. And and we would do well to pay heed and to look at it. So we're going to look at this mystery in in three points. As we really just cover the first six verses of chapter 3 this morning. First, it's stewardship. Second, it's revelation. And third, it's content. So we'll begin with its stewardship. Now, Paul begins this section with for this reason, and, and that serves as a tight connection of thought. There's a tight connection of thought, both with what goes before and setting up what comes ahead. This section is, is the glue that holds chapter 2 to the prayer at the end of chapter 3. Um, Paul is saying, in essence, because of these glorious truths that he's just covered, specifically how God has solved the problem of our deadness and our slavery and us being under wrath by making us alive with Christ, by raising us with Christ, by seating us with Christ, and how God has solved our problem as Gentiles, as being far from God, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, without Christ, without God, without hope, without promises, but he has come and In his body on the cross, he's made peace. He's made us into a new man. He has reconciled us both together with God. For this reason, because of those things, that's that's the connection of thought. Now, what's interesting then is that he doesn't immediately tell us the what. When Normally, when you'd hear, for this reason, you're expecting some sort of verb, some sort of accomplishment. For this reason, I am going to Walmart. For this reason... I am calling you on the phone. For this reason, I am calling you to dinner. What, I'm doing something. For this reason, use it as a verb attached, some action. What is it that he's setting up? And if you read, it's not altogether obvious. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I've... What, Paul? For what reason what? And he keeps going. I I would suggest to you that verses 1 to 13, um, really 1b through 13, are an aside that he comes back to in verse 14. See how 14 begins with for this reason? I think he's finally back to his point. It's one long, here's your blank, introduction to Paul's prayer. I don't think you'll find a verb that matches for this reason in the first 13 verses. I think it's one long um, aside, a re-explanation. In other words, Paul's getting ready to pray that the, for this reason, really, is for this reason I pray. For this reason I bow my knee. But before he can get to that prayer, he's got to reiterate and lay out again some of the things he's already said. Okay? So you can read through that. You can confirm what I'm saying. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that the for this reason of verse 1 really ties in with verse 14. What that means then is the content of chapter 2 is sandwiched by prayer. Chapter 1 ends with a pastoral prayer, and what was the main emphasis of that prayer? That God would, by his Spirit, give them power 
and revelation to understand and to know things. Well, let's take a look at the, the emphasis of his prayer in chapter 3. Verse 14, For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend. With all the saints, what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I think it's a prayer, again, for understanding, that they would comprehend, that they, verse 19, might know. So if if I'm right on that, then what you've got is chapter 2's content, the two contrasts, is sandwiched on either side by prayers by the Apostle Paul that his readers might understand and comprehend what he said. That tells me the content of chapter 2 is central and critical in Paul's mind. He, he sets it up with a prayer. Before I tell you what I've got to tell you, I want to let you know I do nothing but pray that you might have the ability by God to understand. He says it, and then he closes, Oh God, that you would help them to understand what I've said. Which means the content of chapter 2 is probably more important, more foundational, more critical than we hitherto would think. Especially as you see as we look through these verses, he's going to reiterate and repeat some of the things he's already said. So as we place this text in Ephesians, we're on the other side of those two contrasts. He's getting ready to pray, but before he can pray, he's got to say it again. He's got to add some more contents. He's got to add some more details. But that's, that's Paul's thought, I believe. For this reason, there's a tight connection of thought. And Ephesians 3, 1 to 13, is an introduction to Paul's prayer. And then we get I, Paul, which is emphatic. Uh, Paul only uh, writes this way ten times in his letters. I, Paul. Uh, Four of them are in greetings. He'll close his letters. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. And three times as a solemn warning. I, Paul, charge you. And here I think there's something in between. Paul is trying to bring intimacy in and solemnity. This is important. And he's reminding them he's sitting in a jail cell. He himself is concerned with them. He planted this church in Ephesus. It's grown. It's spread. And he truly is passionate for them. He truly is concerned for them. He truly is burdened for them. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me. And so we're reminded of the context that Paul is writing from. Paul is sitting in a Roman jail cell, and he describes himself as the Lord's prisoner on behalf of the Gentiles. I'll ask you to turn to the uh, book of Acts, chapter 13. We're going to take a brief look at the reality here. Paul is very much the Lord's prisoner because of the Gentiles. As we turn there, I'm going to ask you to consider what is it exactly in Paul's message and conduct that got him thrown into jail, specifically? Well, you could say it's his preaching of the gospel. That's true. Is there any particular aspects of the gospel in particular that upset people? I think you'll see it's precisely the truths he's just taught in chapter 2 that got him in such hot water. So in Acts chapter 13, Paul is at Antioch and Pisidia. And I want to pick it up in, at the end of his sermon in verse 38. So Acts 13, 38. He's, he's bringing his sermon to a close. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, he's he's in a synagogue, he's talking to Jews, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if no one tells it to you. As he went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. So it looks like a good response in the synagogue in Antioch. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. This is looking good. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. 
But when the Jews saw the crowds, crowds of Gentiles, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It is necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading through the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout, devout women of high standing, the leading men in the city, stirring up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. It is precisely Paul's inclusion of the Gentiles without demanding that they become Jews, without demanding that they become circumcised and adopt the law of Moses, that is making the Jews jealous and stirring up the persecution. They initially like his message until they see him freely offered to the Gentiles. The whole city comes out, they become jealous, and they stir up persecution. And, and they're really upset because they follow him. Paul goes to Lystra. Go, look, go to chapter 14 of Acts. Paul begins preaching in Lystra. Look at verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch, where he just left, and Iconium. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. Understand, the Jews of Antioch really didn't like this inclusion of the Gentiles. So we'll jump forward a little further. Go to 15, Acts 15. Um, and part of what I want you to see here is what an issue the inclusion of Gentiles in the early church was. We get our first church council here in Acts 15. As the church leadership comes together to consider the question, it's no small problem in the church. Look at Acts 15.1. Some of the men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. It's faith in Jesus plus circumcision and adherence to the Mosaic law. That's their message. And the church has to decide, is that right? And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others who were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way to the church, they pass through Phoenicia, Samaria. And then what you get in the rest of 15 is this council as they decide the matter. Do the Gentiles need to be circumcised? Because Paul has been freely offering the gospel to the Gentiles and is stirring up controversy both with the unbelieving Jews and also within the church itself there's confusion. And what we see is finally James, the brother of Jesus, in verse 19 gives the, the conclusion, the judgment of the council, um, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled with blood. So the answer is no. They, they, they don't need to be circumcised. No, they don't need to adhere to the law of Moses. They ask them to abstain from some certain particularly offensive things for Jewish sensibilities, and that's it. Now, notice what they haven't resolved yet is do the Jews need to keep following the law of Moses. They've only solved the question about Gentiles. Do the Gentiles need to? And the answer is no, the Gentiles don't. The church has decided this. That is still, though, going to be the issue that's going to get Paul in hot water. Turn to um, Acts ooh, 18. Where again, I mean, if you read to the book of Acts... Um, the, the overwhelming majority of Paul's persecution and trouble comes from the Jews who are jealous and angry that he's preaching and offering their promises, their covenants, their Savior to the Gentiles. Acts 18.12, But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading the people to worship God contrary to the law. We could go on and on, but let's just jump now to chapter 21, where Paul actually gets arrested. And we get some insight into the controversy, both inside and outside of the church, with Paul's discussion with James. So in Acts 21, 17, when he had come, when we, Luke's now um, part of the traveling company, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And 
When they had heard it, they glorified God, and they said to him, You see, brothers, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. So now we're dealing with Jewish Christians. They are zealous for the law, and they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. So Paul's teaching had been exaggerated. Paul has clearly taught, we've seen this in Ephesians, it is not necessary for anyone, Jew or Gentile, to follow the law of Moses. Now, he hasn't forbidden Jews from doing this. If a Jewish Christian wanted to keep the Feast of Booths and they weren't doing it to be saved, well, they're free to. And in Romans 14, Paul makes it clear some people observe a day, almost certainly the Sabbath. And they do it to God. That's awesome. And some don't. That's great. So, so they weren't forbidden from, from following customs and traditions in the law of Moses, as long as, he makes this clear in Galatians, they weren't doing it to be justified. In Galatians, he makes it clear, hey, if you receive circumcision to be justified, you're damned. But as long as you understand that, there's some freedom, there's some flexibility here within, within Christendom, within Christianity. But the, the, the report had gone out that no, Paul was going a step further. He was forbidding Jews from doing anything with Moses. And so even though Paul attempts to flex and make it clear that's not what he's saying, look at verse 27. When seven days were almost complete, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd, laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everywhere against the people and the law. In this place, moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy temple. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Well, he hadn't. Well, here's where Paul gets arrested. And the rest of Acts is, is Paul being delivered up to Rome for his trial and then awaiting for the prosecution to come from Jerusalem. This is where he's sitting in jail, writing to the Ephesians. So when Paul says he is the prisoner of the Lord Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles, that, that is strictly accurate. Why is he in jail? Specifically, because he's been freely offering the gospel to the Gentiles. And that has infuriated the Jews and even within the church created division and problems. So, so this is no small matter when he says this. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Back in Ephesians 3. Then he writes on assuming that you have heard. And, and this lets us know the amount of time that's passed. Even though Paul planted the church in Ephesus, the word has spread and he knows many, many of the members of the church have not met him face to face. And again, he's trying to make a personal connection here, personal touch. He, I, Paul, assuming you've heard of me. And he understands that what he's saying here is new. There's a newness to what he's saying. He's going to explain that here. You, you see that. I'm assuming you've heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery is made known to me my revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. This is, there's a newness to his teaching about the reality of Gentile and Jew being one new man in Christ in the church. And so before he prays, and he will pray for their understanding, he, he wants to explain some of this further. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace given to me. So that's one way Paul views himself. He'll call himself the apostle to the Gentiles in other places, but Paul is a steward. He's been entrusted with something. And this is an important distinction. The message is not Paul's to tamper with. He's been entrusted with a message. The Lord has told him, I want you to, to tell this to people, specifically the Gentiles. But he's been entrusted with it. He can't tamper with it. He can't mess with it. He can't add or subtract from it. He's been entrusted with a stewardship, a responsibility to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He, he makes that a little clearer a little later in this chapter. He says, verse 8, To me, though I'm the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he has a stewardship given to him of God's grace that was given to me for you on behalf of the Gentiles. So Paul has made it clear. You're on my heart. You're on my mind. I'm in jail for you. I've been given a ministry for you. And, and the implications, please listen to me. Please hear me. Please believe me. Please understand how much I care for you. Again, all heightening the import of what he's about to say and what he has said for you. And your blank there is Paul is the apostle 
for the Gentiles. He, he calls himself that explicitly in Romans eleven thirteen. I am the apostle to the Gentiles. It's interesting that the Lord God chose a rabbi, a studied Jew, a master of the Old Testament law, student of Gamaliel, to be the apostle to the Gentiles. But in his wisdom, that is what he has done. So that's, that's the opening. Paul explains he is a steward of a mystery. He's in jail on behalf of the Gentiles because of this mystery. And he's, he's reminding them, you, you've heard of the, my stewardship that I've been entrusted with. Now we're going to go to its revelation. Uh, its revelation. This mystery's revelation. So he, he's been entrusted with a stewardship. And again, I think the reason he's highlighting this is this is something new. And this is something, to some extent, you cannot prove from the Old Testament. Nothing that Paul's about to say will contradict the Old Testament. But the biblical notion of a mystery might be better understood as a secret. We think of a mystery like a whodunit. And so if you're reading a good mystery, I like Agatha Christie's, if you're reading them, you're supposed to be able to piece it together beforehand. In fact, that's part of the test. Could you figure it out before Hercule Poirot um, gathers everyone together and, and solves it? That's not what he means here. It's clear he means here. This wasn't revealed. And now it's clear in the Old Testament, God has a plan for the Gentiles. It's clear in the Old Testament, there is going to be some massive conversions and bringing in of Gentiles. But exactly how that's going to happen, the Old Testament does not clarify that. And so Paul's teaching, specifically in the second contrast that we saw, um, that verse 14 of chapter 2, he has made, him, he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and expressing ordinances. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And then explicitly, um, Verse 19, so then, Gentiles, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built in the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So this glorious reality, that there's no longer a dividing wall of hostility, the Mosaic law no longer separates Jew and Gentile because it is no longer governing as lex, as our set of rules, God's people. So that now God in Christ can create one new man. It's not that Gentiles become Jews, but Jew and Gentile become a third thing. They become, I think, the church. That's this glorious mystery. And he understands that's not something he can prove from the Old Testament. He has to appeal to divine revelation. He recognizes that if he wants his readers, he wants us to accept it, we have to accept it based on his apostolic credentials, which is why he's laying them out here. So first, this mystery was made known by a revelation. This mystery was made known by a revelation. By the way, that also, I think, helps explain why Paul is praying something similar for his readers. God revealed this truth to him by a revelation. But look again at verse chapter 1, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and knowledge of him. Isn't that interesting? So Paul is saying, the Lord supernaturally revealed this truth to me. And I'm praying as I get ready to lay it out for you that he might reveal to you its truthfulness as well. Um, there's this tight connection of thought here. How the mystery is made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. So the mystery is made known by revelation. And of this mystery, Paul has already written briefly, he says. Um, now, there's some question about what that reference is to, where he says, even as I have written briefly. It's possible, this is in reference to some writing of Paul's we don't have. Paul wrote many more things that are in Scripture, and so it could just be a writing or letter of Paul's that was not meant to be, was not um, inerrant and meant to be Scripture. It's also possible Paul is referencing his letter to the Colossians. I'll let me read to you a few verses from Colossians chapter 1, where he briefly mentions this mystery. He is now reconciled in his body of his flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a minister. Now, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, 
of which I became a minister according, now here's the similarity of language, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. There, we get the connection of his stewardship, his apostleship, this mystery. So this reference to having written briefly could be to Colossians. It's also possible he's simply referencing what he wrote earlier in the letter. Well, we're not sure. We can't be certain. He's, he's written previously of this briefly. And that the options would either be what he said earlier in, in, in Ephesians, specifically in chapter 2 and even in chapter 1. It could be a reference to what he wrote briefly in Colossians, or it could be a reference to something he wrote that we simply know nothing of. But the main point is, even though he wrote briefly before, he's now writing more extensively now. And that's, that's what the point he's getting at. When you read this... You can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So, this mystery was written of by Paul already, and here are the two points in this. His insight into the mystery of Christ is apparent. So even though God revealed this truth to him directly and supernaturally, for us, this revelation is in the text of what Paul has written. Paul's saying, don't, don't mean, sometimes we can skip over the obvious stuff. Paul's saying, as you read what I've written, you can see my insight. So again, even though Paul, um, either through a vision or being caught up to heaven, or he was revealed this supernaturally for us and for the Ephesian church, the insight and the revelation comes as we read. And so before we began the, um, this message this morning, I was praying that God's spirit would help us to understand, because that's what Paul's doing. He's written it here, and it's in the reading of it that we can see the insight that Paul has. And the second point is his insight into the mystery is critical. His insight into the mystery is critical. That was probably the single biggest point that struck me this week was Paul really is, is concerned about this truth sinking in and being apprehended by faith by his readers. It, it really is of urgent importance for him. And, then, and as I was reading through Acts, it made more sense. He saw the division in the church that happened, the conflict the quarreling, the warring, the animosity, the persecution, because it wasn't believed and received. And even within the church in Jerusalem, amongst those zealous for the law, there was issues. The, the early church is grappling with, wrestling with how the Jew and Gentile fit together. And Paul, sitting in a jail cell in Rome, is burdened with the church at Ephesus, and burdened, I think, by extension, that we would understand the, the unity that we have, the oneness we have in Christ. And so he, he's, he's laying out his apostolic credentials. He's laying out where he gets this from because he wants us to receive it and believe it. Even as he's getting to pray again that, that his readers would understand what he said, he, he's got to say this again, all of which heightening its importance for us. Third, we see that this mystery has only just recently been revealed by God. Um, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this is a mystery. This is something you, you can't find a prediction of the church in the Old Testament. Nothing clear, nothing overt. You can't argue this. Now, nothing about this contradicts the Old Testament, the Old Testament predicts clearly. We even saw in Paul's preaching, God is going to do a work for the Gentiles. We, we saw Isaiah 49, which Paul quoted at Antioch. Um, is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Or Isaiah 45, 22, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So we know God has a salvific plan for the nations, for the Gentiles. We know that he's not simply just working with Israel, but how he's going to fold the Gentiles and the nations in is unclear. And Paul's clarity here that he is going to take Jew and Gentile and in Christ form them into something new, a new man, is a new revelation. It wasn't made known previously, but now, and Paul doesn't say he's the only one who understands this. We saw even James in, in Acts 15 understanding this. But now, it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. By the way, that links back to 2.20. 
the household of God is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So there's a sense in which Paul is saying, you can confirm this by talking to any of the other apostles, any other prophets. This isn't a teaching strictly limited to him, even though it is new in the history of, of salvation. So it's stewardship. Paul's been entrusted. He's in jail on their behalf. He's been entrusted with the stewardship of preaching for them. He's had it revealed to him by revelation. What is the content of this mystery? And here, there's some repetition. He's saying what he said before. He's saying it with greater clarity. But his content is seen in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Which is very similar to what he said at the end of chapter 2. So then, verse 19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And what Paul does again here now for the third time is he uses triplets, three with words or fellow words. Remember I mentioned this before. The first triplets show up in the first contrast of chapter 2. Go back to chapter 2. The solution to our problem of deadness and slavery and being children of wrath is that literally in the Greek, uh, verse 5, we were made alive together with, one word, made alive together with Christ. Verse 6, raised up together with and seated together with. He takes the normal words for made alive, raised, and seated, puts the preposition sun, with, in, and you get made alive with, raised with, seated with. And so in the, in the first set of triplets, it's stressing our union with Christ. With Christ, in his resurrection, we are raised. In his ascension, we ascend. In his enthronement, we are seated. And then, in the second contrast, we get three more of those with words, but now stressing our horizontal union. We are, in verse 19, citizens with. Soon politoi. With citizens. We are, verse 20, um, one, joined together with, and 22, built together with. Well, here, same pattern. We have three with words. I'll give them to you first, and we'll talk through them. Point A, we are fellow heirs, or heirs with, fellow members, or members with, and fellow partakers, or you guessed it, partakers with, however you want to do it. That's how he's going to describe the mystery. And again, the horizontal reality is what is being emphasized. Gentile and Jew, or for our purposes, everyone in this room, rich or poor, young or old, male or female, single, married, educated, uneducated, whatever, we are fellow heirs, fellow members, and fellow partakers. So let's just briefly work through these glorious realities. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. Um, that, that piggybacks off of what Paul said in chapter 1. If you turn back to chapter 1, verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So he predestined us for adoption, which sets up the basis of an inheritance, which we see in verse 14, who is the guarantee, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. But this is, first and foremost, a Jewish way of thinking. Remember when the rich young ruler comes up to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, the Gentiles are fellow heirs as well now, we learn. And everyone who is in Christ is a fellow heir. We are fellow heirs, heirs together, joint heirs, is I think how the New American Standard translates it. That's, that's part of the mystery. Jew and Gentile alike, together in the church as one new man, are joint fellow heirs. Second, the Gentiles are fellow members of the body. Fellow members of the body. This morning during the announcements, I exhorted you, if you're not a member of this church, this body, 
we'd encourage you to become a member here or find a church you can. But we don't mean membership as in part of a club. We mean member as in union to a body. That's the biblical picture and language. Christ is the head of his body, the church, and the body is made up of fingers and noses and teeth and ears and eyes and the glory and strength and health of the body is its diversity. And, and we dishonor this reality when we treat the body like any number of fast food restaurants where if you don't like the sale they have at McDonald's, you go to Burger King. And if you don't like the time of this service and you like the work, you go to that church. The, the reality Paul wants Ephesians to grapple is that in a real sense, we are co-members of a body. And one of the ways we recognize that is by affirming and verbally recognizing this is my body and I'm co-members with the people here. And, and that's what we mean when we say we think the Lord would have us unite together in a bond of membership, membership of a body, not a social club. The Gentiles are fellow members. And I, one of the reasons why I think the realities that Paul is grappling with here, don't jump off the page, is so important to us is because... In the day where he's writing, tribal affinity is huge. We've gone to almost the opposite extreme where we're so individualistic, we hardly view ourselves as members of any groups. I, I doubt many of us struggled or ever pondered the problem of, man, I'm a Gentile, I'm in trouble. We're so individualistic. So for us, perhaps, the other reality is recognizing these truths are true insofar as they're true of us corporately together. You're an heir in so much as we're all heirs. You're part of Christ's body in so much as we're all part of Christ's body together. That, that can oftentimes be the challenge for us is recognizing that it's not just me and Jesus walking off into the sunset, but he saved me into a body. He saved you into a body. And Paul wants us to understand that. We no longer live to ourselves or die to ourselves. The Gentiles are fellow members of the body. And third, the Gentiles are fellow partakers of the promise. That links clearly back to chapter 2. Go back to chapter 2. He listed five problems we had as Gentiles in verse 12. And each of the before and after contrasts, and this is the second contrast, he lists the problem, and the problem is stated in verse 12. Five problems, and he's one by one addressed most of them, answered most of them. Remember, that you were at that time separated from Christ. Well, now we're in Christ. We were separated from Christ, but now we're in Christ. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Well, now we are fellow citizens with the saints. Not members anymore of Israel, but both Israel and Gentile are now fellow citizens of a heavenly city. Strangers to the covenants of promise. And here's where he answers that problem. Now... We are fellow sharers or fellow partakers of the promise. So he's again solving the problem brought up in the second contrast. It's interesting, by the way, it was promises plural in verse 12. Now it's a singular promise, the promise in the gospel. God promised a Messiah to Israel. He promised first to the woman that her seed would crush the head of the serpent seed. He promised to Abraham that in his seed... All the families of the earth would be blessed. And, and the story of the Old Testament is tracking that line of seed, that promise. But it's clear the Messiah is going to be a Jewish Messiah. In Psalm 2, the kings of the nations who are raging against the Lord and against this Messiah are, are warned to do homage, to do fealty, to bow the knee to this Jewish Christ king and son. Now we learn that as Gentiles... We share in that promise. That promise of this coming deliverer is our promise as well. This is, this is amazingly good news. We are fellow sharers in the promise. I think this is probably particularly what angered the Jews of Paul's day. These Jewish promises that they're holding on to. Yes, we're under the thumb of Rome. Yes, we've been enslaved and we've been moved around. But we have these promises from God that are ours. And Paul says they're the Gentiles too. And they get angry. And Paul wants us to understand the promise in Christ. We share in that promise. Now, I love the fact that he throws in how we share in that promise through the gospel. Gentiles are fellow partakers in Christ through the gospel. 
And Paul, we saw this in Acts, freely preached to anyone who would trust in Christ, to anyone who would turn to him in faith, from anyone who would turn from their sin to him, can share in this promise. The promise is for all who believe. I'll go back to Acts 13, his opening sermon that angered the Jews. I'll, I'll read Paul's words again to you. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes. The Jews in Paul's synagogue didn't really grasp the fact that he meant everyone. They would a few verses later, and they weren't going to like it. But he's clear here. Everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Everyone who believes is forgiven. Everyone who believes is freed. That, that's the amazing mystery Paul wants us to understand. And that means everyone in this room who believes is a fellow heir with you, is a fellow member with you, and is a fellow share in the gospel with you. And Paul's instructions in the second half of this letter are going to be putting into practice that reality, that family reality, that unity reality. I'm just close by looking at Ephesians 4. You'll see his first beginning of application to understand why this is critical. What type of application is Paul going to make from this emphatically repeated critical reality and mystery? Look at chapter 4, verse 1, where he reminds them again he's a prisoner i therefore a prisoner of the lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility gentleness with patience bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace there is one body and one spirit just as you were called in one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. See how Paul's hammering oneness, unity, walk in a manner worthy of that. That's where Paul's going with this. This is meant to lead us to treat each other with love, with deference, with preference. Now we're going to go further in the, in the next week, but... Now I'd like to call the worship team up as we sing our closing song and just challenge you to consider these things, realities that may seem obvious or foundational. Paul is stressing them because he's afraid we're not really going to get it. My prayer is that we would get it, that by God's grace he would give us eyes to see. Let's uh, please stand as we sing our closing song.